Let's welcome Christian. Hi, Christian. Hello. It's good to have you at Code Camp again. Hello. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> nice I'm studio, by the way. Yeah, thank you. So I, I'm, I shouldn't be that red, just, as you can just see it. That's because no, no, my no, monitor you look very is red. Good. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but that will change over the course of the presentation. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm All also right. very honored to, to be the last uh, uh, speaker now for this year's maybe uh, code camp seasons or yeah. We're closing <laughs> in glory. Right, yeah. Okay. So, when was the last time we met? I can't remember it. I mean, this year was definitely last year. Last year. Yes. Yeah. Last year, but I think around that time, right? So it was October mm -hmm. uh, in in Timisoara. It was a very nice warm uh, October. Yeah. Had a great mm -hmm. day at the uh, at the university there. So, yeah. I hope to go back there again one day. We we'll repeat that, definitely. <laughs> so, you, yes. you remember that we had this com that conversation with with Ingo your colleagues yes. and boss yes. uh, that uh, yes. yeah you're about to come to Yash and maybe go to Kishino and then Timisoara, Bucharest, Cluj, maybe I don't know, maybe move for a couple of months here in Romania <laughs> <laughs> something that slightly changed, let's say that a little but, bit, yeah. uh, unfortunately yeah. I think it's only a delay but in the meantime uh, I think this is a good uh, setup and uh, yeah show must go on so what do you have in store for us today, Christian? Yeah, so today I want to talk about um, progressive web apps uh, in general and about Project Fugu in special. Uh, I just need to find the right screen here. There it is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and you might already guess, uh, or now you might see why I'm that red, because I'm seeing that red slide. Uh, <laughs> well aligned, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. let's go ahead then. Good. We'll regroup right. at the end of the, the presentation to continue the conversation. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, so hi and welcome to our last talk for today and yes, probably the code camp season for this year. Uh, so I want to talk about Project Fugu. Um, Project Fugu is an initiative by Google, Microsoft and Intel, so three um, uh, IT companies uh, that have joined forces in order to make the web a more capable place. Now, Project Fugu wants to make progressive web apps even better and to take them to the next level. And that's what I want to talk about today. So before we start, uh, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Christian Liebe and I am uh, working for ThinkTecture. I'm from Germany, uh, southern, southern, southwestern part of, of Germany uh, to be exact. Um, yeah, and I am a member of the W3C Web Apps Working Group. Uh, so some of the PWA specifications, they are standardized there, for example, the Web App Manifest. Um, and I'm also a member of the expert programs by Microsoft, the MVP program, and by Google, the GDE program. Personally, my favorite topics and also my focus topics um, are Angular and PWA. Uh, so as you can see today, I'm talking about one of my yeah, most favorite topics, uh, PWA. You can find the slides of this presentation that you see right now also um, later uh, on this website here. Uh, I will update, sorry, I will upload them tomorrow at latest. Uh, probably not tonight because I have to leave quickly after my talk. Um, and if you have any questions, then feel free to now ask them in the chat, I think, and we will talk about them at the end of that of this talk. Um, but if you uh, have any questions after uh, our code camp day today, uh, then feel free to drop me a line on Twitter. My DMs are open, or uh, to drop me an email to christian.liebel at thinktecture.com. All right, now um, this talk is about Project Fugu and how it takes progressive web apps to the next level. So I think we should talk about what progressive web apps are in, in the first place. So progressive web apps are a great cross-platform application model. Uh, you implement a web application and you implement that exactly once, um, and then you deploy it to a server. And now it doesn't matter which uh, platform your client uses. It can be um, Windows, for example. It can be macOS. It can be Linux. It can be Android. It can be iOS or whatever platform you can imagine. All that your users do is to open a website. 
And um, if they want to, they can also decide to install your application to their local system. That means that you will receive a shortcut that helps you open that um, application a little bit easier. And also, uh, the appearance of that application now changes a bit. So it will not only run in a browser tab anymore, but instead it can be executed in an own window, which makes for a very nice native look and feel. Apart from that, progressive web apps can uh, run offline. Uh, also, that makes them really fast because they can be loaded from a local cache. Uh, so they, are, they also work if you are in a tunnel, for example, or in an area where there's no good mobile data coverage. Also, uh, on most platforms, basically all platforms except iOS um, and Safari, uh, PWAs can also receive push messages. So you can also send an information to your user even if they don't have the app open. And also, there's a lot of other um, capabilities that web applications had already. So, for example, web applications can already for a long time access your webcam and microphone. They can access your location, for example, um, and so on and so forth. And so this is cool. This is good. Um, but obviously, there's, uh, there are some other features that native applications can use and that web applications can't, at least until now. And that could be, for example, um, file system access. So right now you cannot really, in a, in a comfortable way, um, access files on the file system and uh, you cannot overwrite them. So you cannot load a file, perform some changes and save it back. That's currently not possible on the web platform. Then it's also not possible to have a raw clipboard access. Now that means that you can basically place and read um, data from the clipboard in arbitrary formats. Currently, this is either restricted to only text um, or to text, HTML, and images. And finally, you do not have access to the table of uh, locally installed fonts. Now, that's for uh, privacy reasons, um, but tools like Photoshop, for example, if they had an online uh, website, they would uh, like to have the list of, of local fonts installed. Uh, now, as you can see, there are some lacking features and some, lack, some lacking capabilities. And now Project Fugu wants to basically close this gap between the possibilities of native applications and of web applications. Yeah, as you can see with that font uh, table example, there's a good reason why you would not want to have that capability because you could basically scan the list of fonts. And I think that would be a really um, nice fingerprint, fingerprinting um, value uh, if, you have, for example, specific corporate fonts installed, I could uh, yeah, recognize you again the next time you visit my website, which is not okay, of course. And so you can already see the problem. Uh, it's cool, it would be cool to have those features, but there might be some security or privacy related problems to them. Now, this is where this little guy comes in. This is a blowfish or a Japanese, uh, in Japanese it would be called a fuku fish. Um, this uh, fuku fish is a uh, popular Japanese dish. The problem is um, that the fugu is poisonous. So if you, um, uh, if the restaurant that you are, it needs a license. And if it's done uh, correctly, then uh, fugu is, is a great, a great meal because it has a very special feeling on the taste and that makes it very unique. But if prepared in the wrong way, uh, you can probably die from that. So that's why the Project Fugu team exactly or specifically chose the Fugu fish as their mascot, because it means we want to give developers access to um, those very interesting um, capabilities with native power. And boy, do we have to make sure that this can be done in a secure and privacy preserving manner. So the Fugu fish is the mascot for this project called Fugu. The official name, by the way, is uh, Capabilities Project, but I think uh, I uh, hear the unofficial uh, name much more often. Now, uh, the Project Fugu is an initiative led by, I already talked about that, by Google, by Intel, and by Microsoft. So I think Google and Microsoft, that's pretty clear. Google basically is uh, the um, maintainer of Google Chrome their web browser and of the Chromium engine. And I'm pretty sure you all know it. Microsoft itself switched with the, uh, 
browser Microsoft Edge from their own engine over to the Chromium engine by Google. So I think they are pretty clear. Now, the next question is, what is Intel doing there, right? So they don't have a browser or something. And that's true. But Intel found, uh, found out in their um, telemetry data that users spend more than 50% uh, of the processor time in a browser. So they, as processor uh, manufacturers, they want to make sure that you get the best experience in the program that people tend to use for, the mo for most of the time. Yeah, and now those three companies join forces and they have one goal. They want to bring the web back API by API. And here's how they do it. Here on this slide, you can see the different um, Project Fugu APIs. This is only um, an excerpt of the entire list. Um, we can also have a quick look at that list. I just click on that and bring it over to my screen here. Now, this is the entire list of, um, of the Project Fugu APIs, and there's really a lot to it. For example, so first of all, these are the shipped APIs. There's cool stuff already in there. But if we um, have another look here, uh, we can, for example, see a web NFC API, which allows us to talk to NFC tags, for example. There is a web serial API, so you can talk to serial devices. Here is the raw clipboard access API. Interesting. Um, the local font access API, also interesting. Um, yeah, and basically, basically, as you can see, a lot of other stuff here on this very long list. So these are all interfaces that Project Fugu could finally bring um, to the web platform. And they want to make sure to close the gap between web and native applications. Now, the question is, how uh, do we get on that list? So, for example, um, how did land, how did the web serial API land there where it is? Well, so um, everything starts with the idea that we could, that it would be a cool thing that we on the web have an access to serial devices, for example. So it all starts with that idea. And next, um, what you would do is write an explainer for that idea. Uh, what is an explainer? Um, here are also links, so you could have a further look at them if you like. An explainer is just a document um, where you, uh, yeah, where you note down uh, why you would want uh, to to see that uh, API on the web, and then you can um, send over that explainer, for example, to the Chrome team. Uh, you can open a, tick, a ticket in the Chrome uh, issue tracker, bug tracker, um, and then people will have a look at it. So it all starts with that explainer. Now next, um, the Fugu team will discuss that capability. So first of all, they check the capability, if, it's, if it actually makes sense, um, or if it's just you, so to speak. But if it makes sense, uh, then they discuss this capability with developers, with other browser, browser vendors, and also with uh, standard organizations. Next, you would iterate heavily on that explainer and finally uh, compile a design document from it. An explainer is now, um, sorry, a design document is now a more elaborate version of that, of that explainer. It's not yet a specification, uh, but for example, it shows the intended architecture. The next step is that this um, design document will be sent to the technical architecture group tag of W3C for a review. And then um, this committee, a subcommittee of w, uh, W3C, will have a look at your design document and basically check if it's compatible with um, the way how standards should be written for the web, if it's uh, compatible with um, other interfaces that we have, if it is, uh, had detrimental effects on privacy, for example. That's all stuff um, that would be found during tech review. Now let's assume that tech review was positive, then um, a, fo a formal spec would be written. Typically this would happen within the web incubator community group. Um, this is a community group of the W3C. So that means it cannot publish uh, formal specifications. So basically it would now, you would now write a technical specification document for it, but that's not yet an official uh, standard um, for the web. The next step is that this um, capability would then be implemented in Chromium. 
And again, that would be done parallelly. So before this is an official web standard, but that's basically always, nearly always the case, it would already be implemented in Chromium. Um, and at first, typically those uh, capabilities launch behind a flag. And that means, uh, for example, you have to enable a flag like uh, enable experimental web platform features, and then you could try out that um, specific uh, function or capability. Now, when everything looks good and your capability just does great, um, then the Chrome team will start a so-called origin trial. During origin trial, you can already use a capability that is actually behind a flag and enable it for the users on one specific origin. An origin is a combination of protocol, host, and port. So for example, you could go and get an origin trial for example.com port for, for free. And then uh, use that uh, capability that would be behind a flag uh, on your website and test it out already. And if origin trial was successful, then it will be enabled by default in Chromium. If also the um, specification uh, development uh, works out fine and there's a second implementer, that means if there's Apple or Mozilla interested in implementing this as well, uh, then it can get to the uh, to the official standards track. It can be transferred over to the W3C uh, working group that uh, the specification would fit into, for example, the web apps working group. And it could then potentially make its way to recommendation, which would be an official web standard. All right, now here's the way how Fugu APIs look. Uh, here is an example for the so-called web share API. That API allows you to share content that is text or URLs or even files with other native applications. Then the native file dialog shows and you can select a native application or potentially other PWA where you want to share that content to. So basically you as a developer always call one and the same method navigator.share. Now, I said that progressive web apps are um, cross-platform apps. And that's true. Um, so basically, uh, your browser now has to take care of calling the correct native API for uh, the abstract API that you have called. So for instance, on Android, we would have to uh, call the so-called share intent, which brings up the native shared file, di sorry, native share dialog. Um, on Windows, we would have to pass it over to the data transfer manager and on macOS to the NS sharing service picker. And on other platforms, there are other native um, yeah, interfaces as well. Now, the cool thing is that, again, you as, a, you as a web developer always call one and the same method and the browser takes care of calling the correct native API. Also, it's quite cool because the browser is always compiled for a certain target. So if Chrome knows it's being compiled for Windows, it will automatically fill in that navigator share implementation and relay that call over to the data, to the data transfer manager. When you use Project Fugu APIs, you should always bear in mind that there might be some browsers that do not have uh, support for that API yet. So, Actually, uh, the web share API that you can see here is a great example because it's um, implemented in Chrome and Edge and also in Safari. Um, in Firefox, I believe it's not yet implemented, but it should follow over the course of this year. So basically during the rest of that year. But um, there still might be browsers that uh, are that do not ship with uh, support for um, web share API. So right now that would be Firefox, but Internet Explorer would also not have access to that API. Now it would be it would be a shame if your application would not run on IE 11 just because you want to use the web share API. Uh, so if it's just a forms over data application, for example, there's no reason to exclude uh, Internet Explorer 11. And so that's why uh, you, all that you have to do basically is add, uh, is add an if statement here. So, and you check if there's a share property on the navigator method. And if, it's, if it is there, you would call it. And if it isn't, you either could use a fallback method, for example, use the mail to pseudo protocol to uh, compose an email, or you would simply deactivate that function uh, on the target system. Next, I want to show you some of uh, Project Fugu's APIs. The first one is the so-called badging API. And I really like it because it, uh, again, improves uh, the way that uh, how progressive web apps work on your system. Uh, 
You can already install a progressive web app to your home screen. That's already possible for a long time. Um, and uh, currently what you cannot do, however, is show uh, badges like this here on the Facebook page app. That's something that right now only native applications can do. Now the badging API wants to bring that capability to the web. Um, and the badging API is great because with the help of that badge, you can communicate updates uh, present in an application without distracting the user. And that's in contrast to push notifications because they distract the user and what they are currently doing. So that little badge there is, is really, um, yeah, it's, it's very unobtrusive. Right, so typically uh, that badge would be seen on the home screen or in the dock or on the taskbar and its appearance varies by platform. Now, uh, here is the interface, how that would look. Uh, this is the badging API. Um, so you as a developer um, could uh, soon call navigator.setAppBadge and then basically just say the number of, um, of uh, notifications, for example, or unread messages. And then this little badge icon would show uh, on your um, application badge. And the clear app badge method on Navigator would reset that badge again. Now, um, I want to show you a little demo for that. Let me switch back to our browser here uh, and I will go to, uh, uh, how's it called? I think it's, it's airhorner.com. Let's see. That's the right one. Yes, perfect. So what you can see here is a pretty simple app. If you click on that red button here. Uh, okay, I guess you cannot hear that. Let, let me try if you can hear from the airports. Okay, not sure if that works, but basically it plays a honk sound. Um, and now if you go and install this application, uh, as I said, it will then receive, um, so first of all, it will launch in an own window. That's the first one. And it also has received a um, dock icon. So here you can see the air horner that, made, that, sorry, that installed application now also in the dock. And if you press the honk now, then the, the number on the badge will increase. So you can see a seven, that means that I have, that I have uh, pushed the honk seven times, eight, nine, 10. So that's uh, the badging API in action. I think it's a really nice API. Personally, I use the Twitter PWA on a day-to-day -day basis, and they also support the badging API and then show the number of open notifications, for example. All right, so that's for badging API. The next API is uh, an extension to the web app manifest and it's called shortcuts. Shortcuts basically are um, secondary entry points for your application. So as you have seen, your progressive web app now has a dock uh, icon or um, a taskbar icon, for example. And uh, on Windows, you uh, may be familiar with the so-called jump lists. If you right click a taskbar item on Windows, application can place some, um, some secondary tasks in, in the jump list. For example, if you right click your uh, Outlook application, then it would allow you to directly create an email or um, to send a calendar invite, for example. Uh, mobile platforms have the same concept. If you long press an application icon, then you can see different quick actions. Uh, so here, for example, I brought an example from, um, from the Twitter app. Uh, here on the home screen, you can directly compose a new tweet, um, explore other tweets, see your notifications and show your direct messages. Now, the cool thing is that this here, this Twitter app is not a native application. It is a PWA. By specifying the um, shortcuts property in your web app manifest, that's the file that defines the appearance of your installed PWA, you can add different, yeah, of those secondary entry points to um, to list. Now, currently it's, it's a flat array that could change in the future, um, but for now we have the the possibility to um, statically define a flat uh, list of shortcuts that should appear either on the um, uh, in the in the jump list, for example, on Windows, or uh, as shortcuts on uh, mobile operating systems. This is already implemented in Chrome uh, for Android, and it's implemented in 
I think, I'm not sure if it's only Microsoft Edge for Windows or maybe also all Chromium browsers for Windows. I don't know for sure, but definitely in Microsoft Edge for Windows. All right, let's have a look at the next API. Uh, I personally like that API. It's it's really cool, but maybe it's not that uh, it's not that uh, I'm not sure not that impressive as the other two that we have seen so far. The screen wake lock API basically uh, prevents the screen of the device to uh, to go dark, and actually that's um, in most cases that's the intended behavior. So you want the device to go to sleep if you don't use it. But there might be some uh, situations where this might be really bothersome. And uh, that's, for example, if you are using a cooking website. Uh, so let's imagine you have some, some dough on your hands, for example, and you want, to, uh, you want to use your tablet. That simply doesn't work great. Uh, so uh, your tablet should not turn off. The problem is that recipe websites have found that out themselves, and basically their current workaround to to prevent the screen from from going dark is to play a video in the background. Because in that situation, the screen does not go dark. However, that has a terrible um, yeah effects on the battery lifetime of your tablet. So I did that. I was on the website, and the screen didn't turn off. Didn't turn off, fortunately. But after an hour, the battery has went dry. So that's also not the best approach. So, but that was telling um, the Fugu team that we should do something about it, right? We want to prevent the device from turning off the screen, um, but not have to use a terrible hack such as um, playing an invisible video, for example. So uh, in the result, we now have the so-called screen wake lock API. Again, we have to make sure that the API exists and if it does, we use it. Um, and then you can request a wake lock. Uh, now there are different um, yeah, things to, things to uh, note when using this API. For example, wake locks can automatically be released. For example, if you close the application, if you switch the tab, then wake locks will automatically be um, released. But if you are simply continuing to watching the website, the wake lock will retain and um, yeah, prevent the screen from going dark. So basically, this is a small um, API that uh, does some, uh, some, how would you call it, some polishing uh, for web applications and websites. But maybe it's not that, um, yeah, uh, that's that one uh, that much of a surprise. All right, the next API is called Shape Detection API. What this API does is it detects faces, barcodes, and text in images or live video streams, for example, with the help of the uh, native um, with, na with the help, of help of native interfaces. Now um, that means your operating system typically already offers um, methods to detect faces, barcodes, and text that can be done in a hardware accelerated manner. And again, we would just relay that call uh, from the web API over to the local interface if it is present. Now, um, the, the th uh, three different APIs look really much the same. Um, basically, the principle looks like this. You um, have a face detector uh, on the global window object, uh, which you can simply create a new instance of. Uh, and then, as I said, you need you, you need at least an image. It can also be a still image from a video stream, for example. But here in that scenario, we are just using a static static image from an image tag. Then, um, if you want to detect, in that case, faces on that image, you just call the detect method and pass the image to it. And then, basically, what you get is an array of all of the different faces that we found uh, in that uh, in that image. Then you can show, for example, uh, the um, location of that specific face. Um, if you want to try that out, here is a demo for that. Um, it would be on liebel.io slash face debt for face detection. Um, and I hope that should be, uh, should be working without uh, enabling the flag. So, um, just if you want to, to test it right on your machine, you can just quickly switch tabs, but don't forget to come back <laughs> and uh, and try out um, that API. 
Um, I cannot show you that here on my machine because I'm currently uh, transmitting my video to Zoom. So I cannot uh, use the camera. Uh, and that's why I recorded uh, this demo um, beforehand. So here you can see me. This is the shape detection API in action. You can see I move my I move my face and um, let me just quickly replay that. I move my face here. Uh, I'm I'm recording the video right in the browser uh, from my webcam stream, and it tries to detect my face here. Um, and it also shows where it detected me. Now, as you can see, it's not 100% perfect. So there's another red rectangle here. Maybe probably you've seen that right here. Here it should be visible. Right, so there it detected a pseudo second face. Um, but yeah, it still um, can come in handy. And again, that also works for um, text uh, recognition and, and barcodes. However, I think face recognition is the one of the best supported APIs, at least right now. All right, now, um, this is also related to the so-called uh, WebML um, uh, group. Uh, there is a new uh, group that will have a look at different machine learning stuff. Um, and uh, Microsoft, Google, and Apple and Mozilla are on board. And what they want to do is to um, implement low level web APIs for machine learning, such as the web neural network API. So it's basically related to that stuff. And as you can see, there's quite some progress going on. All right. Next API is the so-called async clipboard API. I will show that API also in a demo at the end. So I will just show you the API shape. Basically, what you can do with that is uh, copy content programmatically and uh, paste content. Um, and you can do that in an asynchronous way. So it won't block the UI. For example, if you have large chunks of data that you want to copy or to paste, um, your uh, yeah, application will continue to run smoothly. Uh, there are two methods that you can call. There's a write text and read text convenience method uh, that writes text to the clipboard and tries to read text from it. And if you want to deal with um, HTML content or pictures or plain text, you can also use the write and read methods. Currently, as I said, um, browsers only support those, um, at least Safari only supports those three um, possibilities. And the Fugu team is working on the raw clipboard API to unblock access to the clipboard and allow you to use an arbitrary data type. The next interface is called File System Access API. And I'm really thrilled about that API because I think this can truly be a game changer. So currently, websites only have a very limited access to the file system. So yes, there's a possibility to open specific files with the help of the input uh, type file field. Uh, and also, you can download files to the downloads folder by using the, A, uh, the anchor tag and then the download attribute. However, that is not sufficient for productivity applications. Let's imagine Visual Studio Code or uh, Adobe Photoshop or Word or Excel. You don't want to open a spreadsheet, for example, and save it to your downloads folder. That's not great. We want to open a file. We want to modify it and overwrite the original file. So the question is, wouldn't it be great if your web application could exactly do that? Now, the answer is, uh, it's possible now, at least in Google Chrome. And this API was just released in the current stable version of Chrome, Google Chrome 86. And here's how that API looks. If you want to open a file, then you need to call the show open file picker um, on the global window object. Now, again, remember, we need to do some um, feature detection first for progressive enhancement. So we see if that method is there. And if it's not, we need to use the fallback. All right, then we can show the open file picker. There's also options to that. We can say which files we want to, to filter, for example. Um, and when then we let the user select a file and then we get uh, the handle back. Now uh, we can get the blob, that's a binary content um, of the file here in, in the second line. And then we can do something with it. And again, if we don't have the API, then we can use the fallback one or disable the feature entirely. Now, as I said, there's also a configuration uh, object here. So for example, we could choose to um, 
to choose multiple files, not only a single one. And also we can restrict the um, yeah, data types, the file types that we want to open. Here in this example, we can see that I'm interested in image uh, PNG um, documents uh, with the .png extension. Now here I have a little demo for you. And if you want, you can also, again, try that demo out in a separate tab. Um, but again, come back <laughs> to our to, to YouTube then. Um, right, this is a, a web-based clone of uh, the old uh, Microsoft Paint. And what it allows you to do is to, to draw, um, to draw some nice drawings. And this uh, demo now supports different APIs. For example, async clipboard and file system access API. Let me quickly uh, show it to you. All right, so in the browser, uh, wait, I just move the slides over here so you can still see whoop, the website. So you can simply go to uh, paint.js.org uh, and it should look like this. Now, this is a normal standard web application which works great in Chrome, in Safari, in Microsoft Edge, in Firefox. It just works the same. Now, as I said, this is a PWA enabled, so you can also choose to install this application to your machine. That's what I want to do here. I hit install here. Now, uh, the application opens in a standalone window. Uh, I selected that uh, dark blue color for the title bar, uh, so basically it looks like this old Windows 95 uh, window star. Now, I want to show you the different APIs. So let me draw something here. That's a nice house, for example, and now I want to save that. So what I do is to select the save command from the, um, from the file menu. And now with the help of, oh, wait, was that the right one? Was it save as? Hmm. Okay, wait, uh, let's see if it works here. It should actually. Yes, okay, well, oddly it works here. That's Chrome Canary, so maybe something is broken. All right, but let's uh, restore our drawing. Here's a nice drawing, great. And now let's try to save that. Uh, and now we say that's our test PNG. I'm going to save that. Now I bring uh, over my finder window here. I can select the test PNG file. And if I now preview it, we can see that's exactly my drawing that I just uh, yeah, created. Now let's uh, open the preview app. And in the preview app, I can now do some changes here. Uh, so for example, I could uh, also draw something like this squiggle and I can save the file back. All right, now in our application, I can now choose to open a file by saying file open. Okay, sorry, it looks like something is, uh, is broken here. Let's try that in. Uh, on the stable version of Chrome. Hmm. Okay, doesn't look good. I guess I've broken something. Hmm. Okay, let's see. Let's try it again. Okay, yeah, looks like... Uh, I broke something, sorry about that. Uh, but basically what you can do is you should see uh, the same, um, yeah, the same image again. So open uh, doesn't work currently, sorry. Okay, but that's not, not it yet. We can also um, copy content. So for example, let me draw something like this here. Um, I can now, for example, select something and then hit the copy command and now switch back to the preview app and uh, create a new file from the clipboard. And now uh, you can see the content that I selected here from the clipboard, for example. Now I can also again, draw something here, select that, copy it back, and I'll paste it to my client here. And now I get um, a permission window and I say, that's cool, please paste it. And now we can see uh, the change that I did in, um, yeah, in the preview app. Okay, so that's uh, saving files. We didn't see open, unfortunately, but it works the same way. Uh, we saw copying, pasting. 
And now the last thing that I want to show you is also, uh, yeah, it's one of the latest APIs um, is that you can also register for files. Um, so that's what I did here in the paint API uh, for the paint app. So if I right click a file and say open with, and I would now uh, open the paint app, which currently doesn't appear. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's let's see i guess i need to to reinstall that looks like i did something wrong um let's uninstall it yes and try to reload that install it again all right yeah okay so basically <laughs> It's not working right now. I'm so sorry. Uh, I tested it before. Uh, I might have broken something. Um, you, now you also your application would appear here and it uh, basically would open here um, in the paint app. So that's also possible. It's called file handling API. Uh, really new um, and also a great nice addition. And that's really, um, yeah, it's, it's a cool thing for productivity applications uh, like paint. And now let's imagine uh, PowerPoint would do that, Excel would do that, uh, and so on and so forth. So if you ask me where the web is heading to and where the uh, where modern business applications are heading to, in my opinion, that's uh, PWA. So right now we need to use some fallback mechanisms like uh, Electron, for example. Um, VS Code is a uh, first-class web application, right? It's, it's all based on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But currently, they need to wrap their application in Electron, a native wrapper, in order to ship it to native platforms. So basically, that native wrapper could just be um, thrown away if we had everything that Visual Studio needs. And I think file system access is one of the big unblockers for applications like VS Code. Still, there's a terminal, for example, which there's no API for in the web. But I think at least that, um, at least the editor might then work um, in, in the web itself. Also, there are big, fat native applications uh, like PowerPoint, for example. It would be really cool if we could just execute them in the browser. Um, for PowerPoint, I would say that the major that, that all of the required features are actually on the web platform, um, n at least now with the help of um, the file system access API. All right, now to wrap it up. Personally, um, I think that Project Google is a really cool thing. It helps uh, become uh, the web to become more and more capable. Um, Project Fugu APIs should bring and could bring a uh, more uh, interesting app experience to the web, such as IDEs, productivity apps. Um, but what we also have to say is that there are alternative approaches and platforms that threaten the, the web. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, uh, yeah, um, are, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> basically are an enemy for, uh, for the modern web. Um, and also the support for modern web APIs varies from platform to platform. So basically we need you as web developers. So please file bugs in browser engine, bug trackers, tell, for example, the Safari team when you need interfaces like push on iOS or maybe file system access. And if you have a new capability that you would like to see uh, in the web, then you can file a Fugu request at um, uh, gu.gle slash new dash Fugu dash request. Right. And now I'm curious if there are any questions from your side, Florian. So first of all, congrats for the presentation. It was very, very uh, cool work through. Uh, Thank you. I finally understood what PWA is <laughs> or we finally, no, we're joking. Yeah. So we're developers. <laughs> yeah. And, and it looks like the, the future is bright. And the first question is, uh, from your experience, what do you feel? Uh, in terms of the pace, you know, these features are, you know, ready for production systems. Yeah. Uh, so it's actually, it's, it's hard to say um, because you never know what, uh, what web uh, platform, so what browser vendors will do, right? Uh, but in some cases that actually went pretty fast. So for example, for the web share API, we see, we saw that in Chrome for Android and Apple was the next uh, vendor to implement it on the desktop. They even were the first to implement it on the desktop. Um, so I think for those APIs, you need to calculate maybe 
one to three years, I would say, until they are broadly available. Uh, now, File System Access API just has shipped and it's working in, in Chrome and I believe also in Edge. Um, yeah, and basically time will tell if the other browser vendors also like that API, if they would implement it. Yeah, only time will tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and at this moment, what are the obvious scenario yeah, when you would use PWA in, in production for real business and so we are implementing uh, PWAs in our day-to-day -day business. Uh, personally, I think uh, it's suitable for nearly all kinds of applications, except applications that really need a very deep native integration. Uh, that need, for example, need a um, need to show a um, a tray a tray window or something uh, that's currently not possible to do in a browser if uh, you want to write a driver for example that's impossible to do in a browser if you want to implement an uh, antivirus uh, solution for example that's nothing that you would do there uh, a cloud synchronization tool or something so stuff that really needs a deep native integration or maybe also needs very very exclusive um, uh, performance uh, so yeah very high performance calculations high performance games, maybe that's um, hard to do, but all the other applications, and that's the majority I would say, uh, can be implemented as a PWA. Hmm. All right. And, and from a cost perspective, um, is there any efficiency that PWAs bring to the table? Because you know, people are asking, so for instance, when, when discussing about mobile apps, so, should it be a responsive one or, I don't know, progressive or should it be a native? What would you advise a, a business owner who wants to buy an app? Again, it depends here uh, because uh, in, on the mobile platforms, the scenario is uh, a bit different uh, because here you have um, still plenty, uh, I don't want to say still, you have plenty of iOS users as well uh, and they don't have a that capable browser. Um, so that means the situation may be different on mobile platforms. For example, if you need a native API, API that is not exposed to the web or at least to the native platforms, then you would have to use a native wrapper. So that still does not exclude PWAs. So you can still implement a PWA and put that PWA in a native wrapper by using Apache Cordova or by Ionix Capacitor. There mm -hmm. are sure uh, efficiency benefits because you implement your application exactly once, as you have seen it in that uh, web share demo. Um, uh, you call one line of code, so to speak, and that should run on the mobile platforms and on the desktop platforms and in the browsers. Yeah, that's one Great. of the questions that is answered with depends. Yeah, and that's uh, <laughs> that's our curse, probably. <laughs> Okay, uh, before we close this session and, and the entire series, um, one final thing. So you are a Microsoft MVP, a Google developer expert, and a contributor in the W3C the consortium, right? Yes. What, why do you do that? Uh, what's in it for you? Tell us a little bit. I mean, why should I look at these things if I'm a developer? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, basically, so that's, <laughs> it's, it's a really good question. So basically the MVP award and the GDE program, they're a great um, recognition for, uh, uh, for sort of say leaders in, in the developer community, right? So if you see that blue MVP diamond, if you see that uh, GDE logo, it, it shows that that person um, hopefully is an expert <laughs> for that, for that specific topic. Uh, so you might want to listen to them. Um, W3C is uh, really important for us as developers, I think, uh, because that's where the specifications are written, right? Uh, and that's where the, the roadmap for, for the web is, is being written. Um, so that's why W3C is, is pretty uh, cool. That's why I participate in there. Uh, and why do I participate there? Because I think that, uh, yeah, I can contribute to it. Um, I know a lot of developers. I'm a developer myself. And so also I want to represent the interests of developers uh, like you, like us all, um, at the browser vendors, standardization organizations, and yeah, companies like Microsoft and Google. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a noble mission, I would say. 